Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Elisa Frasnelli. I'm senior lecturer at the School of Life Sciences at the University of Lincoln. My main interest is the animal behavior. In particular, I'm uh, interested in the behavior of uh, uh, small animals, such as uh, bees. I've been investigating their um, cognitive abilities when they navigate to search for food. But today I would like to talk to you about something that is really important to all of us and to our planet, which is the impact that climate change is having on, uh, on the bees and on other pollinators. Uh, and I would like also to introduce you to uh, all the initiatives that have been taken here at the university on the Brayford campus in order to help our pollinators. So, we know that um, we are experiencing more and more extreme season, and this is something that uh, we can see from uh, the newspapers, uh, from the news uh, on television. We've seen floodings uh, in Asia, we've seen uh, firebush in California, in uh, Australia, and very dry seasons as well. And of course, this has an impact on the behavior of animals and, and also on the growth of, of plants plants and, and nature in general. For example, at the Arctic, they, they, they have experienced the, the most increase in temperature with extreme consequences for the polar bears, as in the photo here, where they couldn't basically have a habitat anymore. And the, the Washington DC uh, Meteorological Station also has registered uh, earlier and earlier uh, blooming of flowers. And of course, all of that have an impact, have an impact uh, on uh, uh, pollinators. So you may be familiar with the so-called colony collapse disorder, the very sad phenomenon. Uh, that uh, our bees uh, and pollinators have experienced uh, recently uh, with uh, extreme consequences for, for their lives. This um, has been due to several reasons, uh, among them uh, the uh, path pathogens such as the varroa mites, you can see here on, on this larva of, of the bee, that the tiny mite, but also the uh, use of pesticides, especially in monocultures, uh, have shown to have an effect on the way uh, bees uh, um, can uh, navigate and on their ability to go back home after a foraging trip. But also the uh, habitat loss uh, due to the use of pesticides, but also the use of, of extensive monoculture in, in agriculture. Uh, for example, uh, sunflowers uh, are uh, nutritionally unbalanced. They, they can provide lots of food, but for a very small amount of time to bees. In, in, moreover, they, they contain less protein than the aloe pollen. So the monoculture farming has really um, had a, a, a very mm, bad impact on the on the destruction of the local uh, biodiversity and the abnormal climate is impacting the growth of plants and, and plants don't get pollinated and as a consequence bees are left without food. So the increase of extreme events have an impact on bees as they may lose the synchronicity with the forage plants and the reduction of sustainable habits, habitat for, for them brings to, to shift in ranges with, with species that uh, need to spread north where more sustainable habitat is available. This also uh, brings to the, the, the facilitation of, of the colonization of new species, and which has an effect, an effect on the interspecies relationship and survival and reproduction. For example, here in Britain, since 2001, we got the, the tree bumblebee, 
which is a kind of recent uh, new species uh, that have found uh, a good habitat here, but that wasn't uh, in Britain before 2001. And of course, all of that uh, brings to uh, extinction, to an extinction risk for these species, which is very sad. Here I wanted to show you some data uh, that are not so up to date, but still it shows over 33 years, starting from 1980, here in Britain, what were the trends in uh, uh, the widespread of wild, uh, wild bees and ho hoverflies. And we can see, unfortunately, that all the four lines are kind of going down, means, meaning that uh, we have a reduction in, in, in the species availability. And actually the decline has been shown to be close to a third, which is really, really bad. Another study here has compared uh, the situation in, in Britain and in the Netherlands to show that this is a widespread phenomenon. And those uh, colors in the map uh, showed us uh, the areas where there were no, no change uh, since 1980 in the species richness, whereas the, the red one show where we had a decrease and the blue one where we had an increase. And we can see that for bees, unfortunately, uh, the, the top uh, plots, the top uh, maps, we have uh, a decrease uh, in, in the richness of our species. And an example is uh, the early uh, bumblebees, the, the Bombus pratorum here, the, the beautiful yellow creature on top that uh, has been decreased a lot, and also the red tail um, bumblebees, the Bombus lapidarius that has experienced the same uh, decline here in Britain. But some good news, um, we also had some species that in, instead increased, and among them we have the common uh, carder bumblebee, you may have seen on flowers around, Bombus pascorum, and the tree bumblebees, uh, on that yellow flower here in the photo, uh, Bombus, the bumblebees Bombus hypnorum. And uh, um, the climate change, uh, of course, this, this difference in season have had an effect also on other pollinators that maybe are not so common here in, uh, in the UK, but uh, are very important in, area, in other areas such as South America, for example. Hummingbirds among them, hummingbirds are now struggling to find uh, an area where they can protect themselves from the sun to, to get some shade because of those increased temperature over there. And baths, very important pollinators as well. And climate change has shown um, to have an effect on their hibernation periods, but also on their ultrasound hearings, making them, uh, you know, making it difficult for them to, to forage. So um, the, um, the increase of climate variability has have an effect on other species as well and on us. And here I wanted to uh, show you an example by a study which was published in PNAS um, by some American researcher, uh, showing that uh, the increase of climate variability brought a decrease in the parasitism frequency and what one might think that this is good, but actually the, the, the par some parasites are, are very good for us because they, they provide a natural control for uh, agricultural pests. One example is here the uh, Incarsia formosa, that uh, little tiny um, creature there, um, which provide a very important uh, uh, control for the white fly, especially in greenhouse, for uh, the um, pr production of, of tomato. And here we, we see the, a photo of uh, actually the um, Encarsia formosa, the, the black dots, and the white flies on a, on a tomato uh, leaf. So the decrease of, of the parasitism frequency has brought to a, an increase in the frequency of herbivore outbreaks with some consequences, of course, on, on, and effects on, on plants and as a consequence on agriculture and on everyone. So this is just to show that it's, it's not something really far affecting only some species, but 
because we are all part of, of the life cycle, at the end of the day, it affects us as well. So what is our responsibility in that? Well, we have some responsibility because uh, we are contributing to that through this deforestation, which of course implies that uh, bees have uh, less uh, um, habitats available. Agriculture, I explained that already through parasit uh, pa pa uh, through um, um, the use of pesticide, but also the, the monoculture um, farming as at an impact on, on our pollinators. Fossil um, fuel combustion, of course, is releasing uh, um, carbon dioxide and other substances uh, in, in the air and in the ground, as well as the domestic livestock. So all that has, is in some way connected to the effect of, of climate change through the, the greenhouse effect and so on. So what, what can we do now? Let, let's hope we can have some, some good news as well. So I think we all have a responsibility, first of all, as scientists. We can, of course, assess the impact of, of climate changes. This can be done through the um, so-called phenology, so the study of natural uh, seasonal um, uh, not the study of, of, of cyclic and, and seasonal uh, natural phenomena in relation to uh, climate and the plant and animal life. And uh, um, this can be done through historical records. Here I uh, presented an example where uh, pollinator spe specimens are, have been studied in a, in a museum. Here in the photo, we have uh, Dr. Erica uh, McAllister uh, at the uh, National History Museum. Um, and uh, the, um, of course, we, we, you can correlate uh, these, uh, um, the pollinator specimen richness with uh, some temperature data to, to track the changes in, in insect populations, which is very important. Um, some studies have been run in the field. For example, here um, we have a study uh, run in the south of the US in a very dry area to look at the impact of uh, the uh, thermal environment over the development of a solitary species of, 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 of bees. And we can do things uh, in, uh, in the lab as well. We can run some experiments. And uh, for example, it has been shown that bees, and this is a good news, can, can shift uh, their uh, foraging effort towards uh, uh, some resources to, to complement those uh, nutritional deficit I mentioned at the beginning. But we have also taken some uh, uh, initiative on campus here at the University of Lincoln. Um, for example, uh, we have uh, placed a urban bee, in, bee garden on top of one of our uh, buildings. And you can see here a photo of a beautiful bumblebee, Bombus terrestris, feeding on one of the plants there. Some kitchen garden has, uh, has been um, started uh, on campus uh, as well. And uh, in Rice Home, in the other campus, uh, um, an initiative has uh, tried to, to grow some wildflowers. And all that has been possible thanks to the amazing work that the estate uh, team have done. In particular, uh, I want to mention uh, Alex Foxley Johnson, who did a great job in that. But we also brought some bees on campus, a colony of honeybees. And now I would like to show you a video documenting our bees. Got the colony about a couple of years ago. You can see there is a shed and we place an observation hive inside that shed. There's a little hole in, a, in the wall of the shed so bees can go back and forth and foraging and we can observe them. Here in the, the bee with, with that green dot on the, um, on, the, uh, ab on the thorax is the queen. So you always, there she is again, you always need to mark the queen in order to see her and to uh, monitor her. 
So um, we have installed the observation um, hive and uh, this has been uh, um, great for us as, as teachers, as educators to, to raise awareness about this uh, important issue for our planet, to inform and to involve. So again, thanks to the help of, uh, of Alex Foxley-Johnson, we have uh, run some um, um, meetings, meetings with the bees, uh, unfortunately not under the pandemic but we hope we can go back to them soon and here is a photo of me with a white jacket at the back and my colleague uh, Dr. Adrian uh, Goodman so who's a great beekeeper um, with, with the observation hive and we, we, we use it to basically show um, the life cycle of, of the bee to, to uh, the people that were interested in, in meeting the bees in this photo here here you can see a piece of comb that the bees built on, on the glass of the hive. And you can see it's filled up with these orange yellow colors, which is the pollen that they are stuck in there uh, as, um, as a storage. But you can also see uh, hopefully these white larvae, so meaning that uh, our bees were really comfortable in that observation hive and the colony has kept growing. And in the top photo here, you can see our new queen, so it's not tagged yet. Um, but you can see it's a bit different from the other bees. She has a bit longer abdomen. All the other bees are around her. So the colony was able to produce their own uh, new queen with the, with the new season. And so that, that's really great news. We have used this uh, wonderful facility also to run some work experience um, activities during work experience week with some uh, school students. Here you can see some of them showing a jar, little jar of honey that we gave them, them as a kind of souvenir for the uh, activity. And again, them here observing the bees going back and forth and returning from their foraging trips. And some students at the University of Lincoln have been uh, really involved uh, and uh, enthusiastic about the Observation Hive and run some projects there. One of them being um, Robin Fires. She's a BioVet uh, uh, student now uh, doing an M-Bio. She's also a great photographer, as you can see here from that wonderful uh, shot she, uh, she took at the Observation Hive. And she ran a project over the summer to see actually how the temperature was affecting uh, the behavior of the bees uh, by monitoring uh, the, the temperature and the humidity both inside and outside the observation hive. Then we got a, a student, um, a, a photographer, a master uh, who used to be a, um, a master student in fine arts. So we got the interest also of uh, non-science non students. And, and Jody, Jody Hogard uh, came to visit the observation hive regularly to take some amazing photos. She ran a project on that were really, really interested in, in, in the bees and fascinated about their behavior. And here is a wonderful uh, shot she took. You can see the bees are kind of forming that, uh, that uh, um, network almost. They are hanging, like in a hanging chain. And they do that when they are building up new comb. So they are um, scraping out uh, the wax from their abdomen. And all together, they are building up a new comb. Then we have uh, Lily Statham, who is currently doing a PhD uh, with me, and she's uh, investigating the honeybees waggle dance, the behavior that bees perform when they need to communicate about the location of uh, a food resource to their um, uh, mates to their um, other foragers within the colony. So they perform this dance to, to communicate the location um, of, of uh, a good patch of flowers. And uh, you can see in the photo a uh, tagged bees because, of course, we need to monitor the um, behavior of every single individual and to recognize who is who inside the hive. So Lily has tagged um, with those uh, um, uh, commercially available tags um, the, the bees so she can monitor their activity now with the new season, hopefully. 
And then we have also Lucy Bolton, who has instead run a project just finished on uh, the bees activity, in particular of bombus terrestris in winter. And she actually uh, find out that the, the, the fact that we have uh, uh, sh kind of shorter winter um, and the, the, the beginning of the season is uh, is moving earlier and earlier as the, the, the flower blows blossom um, also the, the bumblebee is, uh, uh, seems to get uh, to become more active and almost not hibernate uh, anymore and another project that has been run um, was looking at something that can be helpful for all of us. So I was looking at the type of, of plants that we should uh, plant in uh, Lincolnshire to help our pollinators. And here is Leah presenting you that. Hi everyone, my name is Leah and we're going to be talking about planting for pollinators in Lincolnshire today. So this project was carried out to provide the public with a list of wildflowers that when planted in variation would give their gardens the potential to be in full bloom all year round, which in turn would mean that they would be providing food for pollinators all year round as well. Why are pollinators important? Pollinators are important as they carry out the crucial process of pollination, without which we wouldn't have food such as vegetables, fruits, certain beans such as coffee beans, certain nuts such as almonds, and even the cocoa beans used to make our chocolate. But on top of this, they're also important for our ecosystems. In our ecosystems, we have habitats. These habitats have an abundance of flowers in them. These flowers, in turn, provide shelter and food and other services to our wildlife, which in turn increases an area's biodiversity. So if we continue to lose pollinators at the rate we are, we will lose a lot of the flowers we have. And if we lose flowers from a habitat, we also lose the biodiversity and are left with quite a barren habitat. So why are our gardens important for their survival? In the UK, we have increased agriculture expansion and urbanisation, which means a lot of the land left isn't natural. For example, in England, there's only 14.5% of the land left is natural, which isn't a lot. So if we use the areas which we own, for example, our gardens, to help have little homes inside these urban areas to provide pollinators, it would make their life a lot easier and increase their chances of survival. For example, if we take a street, if a bee lives in point A and the only other food source on the street is point B, the bee has to travel all this way just to get to it, which a lot of things can happen to a bee in this space of time because it's quite a distance to travel. However, if a few of us plant even just a couple of flowers, this bee can make more stops and at any one of these stops it can go back to the hive and back and forth and there's more food for it available. If we look on a neighbourhood scale, for example, where there is a urban green area such as a park, if no one else has flowers in this neighbourhood, these bees are very limited to this small area. However, if some of us who perhaps really enjoy gardening have an abundance of flowers in our garden, these bees can suddenly travel and cover more ground and have more food available to them. Now, if we include those of us who do not like gardening or perhaps do not have the room or the time to maintain a garden, plant even just one or two flowers outside, these bees suddenly have so much more land and food available to them, which of course will help them survive. So why do they need food all year round? Well, bees, just like us, without food all year round, would starve. And even though many of them either hibernate or die off before winter, some of them can still be found deep into winter searching for food, such as the bumblebees. Um, so yeah, that's why it's important to have food for them all year round and why it's important for them to have spaces in our gardens where they can feed as their natural environments are um, dwindling. So making the list. I used the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust wildflower list. From this, I compared this list to the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland's list, which tells me whether or not they're native. If they were native, I then looked on the map of the UK to see if they were included in Lincolnshire. If they were both native and found in Lincolnshire, I would then use the Collins Wildflower Guide to see when they bloomed. Now, the reason I had to make sure they're found in Lincolnshire is because Lincolnshire is quite a dry region of the UK, and on top of that has long cold winters, so it's important that the flowers can survive in these conditions. So a work, for example, so Mandurum was found on the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust list. It was also, according to the Botanical Society's list, is native to the UK, and according to their map, it's found in Lincolnshire, so it would have been included in the list to make the chart. The chart in question is a Gantt chart, which works by having the common species name on the left, the period of blooming represented in the bars, and the months at the bottom. So for example, if we look at ivy at the bottom here, 
we can see that it is in bloom from September to the end of November. So it's in bloom all of autumn. However, to above it, the common glasswort is in bloom from August to the end of September. And it's in bloom halfway through summer to a bit into autumn. So that's how you use this list. And if you plant a variety of flowers from this list, your garden can have the ability to be in bloom all year round. For example, these flowers, if they were planted in combination, you would have at least one flower in bloom all year round. Another example of what your garden could look like in summer versus winter, just to show you that there's pretty flowers available in both, just so you know. Now, the reason why we're looking at native over non-native flowers is because there's been multiple studies carried out that suggest that native flowers are slightly better for our pollinators and exotic ones. For example, the funnel-shaped flowers are better than head or disc-shaped flowers for our pollinators. This also stretches into like food sources, for example, the uh, quality of nectar and pollen available to them, which is what our pollinators feed on. This is because pollinators in the UK, the plants need to be attractive and accessible to them, and if they're not, they cannot use them. For example, salvia splendines. This is a common garden plant that is quite extravagant and beautiful. However, in its natural country, it is pollinated by hummingbirds, which have long beaks and long tongues. Therefore, these flowers are too deep to be pollinated by our English bees, as their tongues cannot reach down the top flower tube to reach the nectar. So even though these gardens may look like they're in full bloom, this food source is very poor quality for our pollinators, which is why it's important to plant native flowers, for example, vipers bugloths in the top left corner or dandelion in the central bit with a honeybee. It's important that we plant these flowers so our pollinators can access them. When it comes to including these flowers in your garden, you do not have to stri stick strictly to wildflowers. You can mix decorative and wildflowers together. Or you can perhaps have margins of wildflowers, like around your lawn or your vegetable patches. You can have paths going through like big bushes or meadows of wildflowers if you like. And for those of us who perhaps do not have the room to garden, do not like gardening, or are worried about these flowers becoming dominant and outcompeting your decorative flowers, you can just put them in pots, which is a great way to um, display them and have them out in the garden. For example, if you've got a concrete garden, you can just put them in a pot. Now the pollinators you attract, because I imagine a lot of us think we're going to attract butterflies and bees. We will, but there'll also be pollinators such as beetles, such as the black and yellow longhorn beetle or the soldier beetle. A huge variety of hoverflies, for example, the marmalade hoverfly or the pine hoverfly. Of course, a large variety of butterflies and also moths, as well as a variety of bees from the white-tailed bumblebee to the tree bumblebee. However, if there is specific pollinators you do want to attract, there is certain information and in flower features you can find online such as, uh, for example, bees cannot perceive the colour red very well as they do not have the receptors in their eyes to be able to see the colour red. However, they do love the colours purple and white. So if you want to attract bees, I would suggest planting these colours more so than reds. Um, there are also academic studies you can find online. For example, this one carried out in 2019. It looked at the exotic and native flowers and the top ranked native flower on that list was wild mandurum, which attracts an array of bees and butterflies, as well as moths. So if you wanted to attract bees and butterflies, I would also suggest planting wild mandurum. On top of that, it's also a herb which could be used in the kitchen, so it's double good. But yeah, this is just to show you that there are many resources online if you do want to attract specific pollinators. But if you don't bother about what pollinators you'll attract, then just plant anything, anything from this list. So to summarise, pollinators are crucial to our ecosystems, as without them, we won't be able to have the abundance of food we have or the healthy habitats. Planting pollinators all year round is important for their survival as they need food all year round. And the flowers in this chart will attract an array of UK pollinators, not just bees and butterflies. Um, and when they plant these flowers in variation, your garden has the potential to be in bloom all year round and help support our pollinator populations. Thank you for watching. So I hope you enjoy uh, Leah's video as much as I did. She did a great job and I really wanted to share that with you all. And um, I hope she also convinced you that we can all do something for our pollinators by, um, you know, um, farming and gardening in a wildlife friendly way. And uh, another option, if you like uh, bees, uh, you can uh, also uh, buy one of these bees hotels uh, where um, you can attract um, 
and you can have actually some of uh, the solitary species of bees growing them. You can see here in the photo uh, the meson bee, the, the red meson bee, uh, Osmia bicornis, and they are solitary bees. So uh, compared to honey bees, they don't live in uh, in big colonies. They live solitary in a solitary way. So each of them has uh, their own uh, nest. Each female is fertile. So it's a um, it's a nice way to to also host some bees in your gardens if you like. We also had one close to our observation hive and we can see and we are waiting for some mason bee to, to emerge. There are some cocoons there which is look very promising. And uh, with that, uh, I will encourage you to uh, check the um, website and blog that uh, uh, Alex Foxley Johnson um, created. Uh, it's, it's really a wonderful resource where you can, of course, enjoy the wonderful photos that uh, uh, she and our student took. By clicking on each of that uh, square, you can uh, navigate uh, through um, the website. You can uh, also see the, the, the video of, of Leah there, and you can read a bit more about what I told you today. And uh, with that, I also would like to thank you very much for listening. And I would be very happy to take questions or comments uh, after that. And um, yeah, I wish you a wonderful uh, rest of the day too. And please get in contact if you have any questions. Thanks. <laughs>